just recently began working um, with Kenneth Reams on uh, Death Row. He has a marvelous vision to have a an exhibition of his art on the death penalty, and it's not just more death penalty art. He's approaching it from a historical perspective. He's gone back to 1608 mm -hmm. to the first execution ever on the North American continent. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's told, the history is told through his art and through um, limited mm -hmm. text, and he has people through the um, NAACP Legal Defense Fund paralegals there doing research for him <laughs> to get all of these facts together. And David Rickert was working with him, and when David died, they needed somebody to step in, so I did. And I could not be happier about that. I I don't know. There's all these black men in my life now that I'm falling in love with. <laughs> <laughs> I have David Montague and Kenneth Reams and my new personal trainer. <laughs> I know what's happening, but it's quite wonderful. You're being integrated. <laughs> yes. We're, we're um, working with the Cox Center to get the... Um, Kenneth's exhibit scheduled for some time in 2014, and I asked them if it could be the last quarter, so we'll have time to work on it. Fabulous. And Michelle's going to help. Yeah. And so. Good. Right. Thank you. Okay. Jean? Oh, my. Where do I start? <laughs> <laughs> the older you are, the more <laughs> history you have. <laughs> so you decide, where am I going to start, you know? Um, my background originally um, is special education, and so that was my training uh, through college and master's level. And uh, that brought me to, of course, my, um, one of my first or second years teaching, we had the Special Olympics for the uh, uh, disabled children. And when I was there, I had my class, and when I was there, I went down to the restroom, because I always have to go to the restroom at least, you know, whatever time. And there was a group of girls, they were teens, and they were just a talking and having a good time. And I thought, and they were wearing the little badges that said that they were participants. And I thought, what on earth is their disability? Because they were just girls. And cute girls, and verbal girls, and, and exuberant <laughs> girls, and uh, so I couldn't stand it. I said, "Honey, what what are you what are you in what are you doing here?" And they said, "We're from the Alexander Girls Training School." And uh, I said, "Tell me about that." So they told me, and at that time, it was an all girls training school <laughs> for juvenile delinquents out in Alexander, and I thought. They're not special ed. But in that day and time, because they were juvenile delinquent, they had to wear the badge of being disabled. Mm -hmm. Whereas my children truly had some uh, physical, emotional, or mental uh, drawbacks, disability, uh, things that were going to hold them back in life. So they needed special ed services. And I thought, <clears throat> This ain't right. Mm -hmm. So I started investigating. And I uh, was working on my administrative license, and I thought, hmm, I need to do something about that. And it just kept worrying me. So uh, I saw in the newspaper that the Alexander Girls Training School uh, had an opening for a principal. And I thought, that's who I'm going to be. So I went over there and applied with my little 1970 pigtails <laughs> and my little bangs. Uh, and um, there was this older gentleman that was retiring, and I said, I want to be principal. And I, on paper, I met everything. He said, you're not tough enough. And I said, sir, you just don't know me. And so he said, no. He said, no, you have to be tough. 
and you have to really know how to take care of people and do them, you know, punishment and all this. And I'm thinking, you're crazy. Uh -huh. So I left. I didn't get the job, but I, I'm a, a turtle head. And I just keep plodding, you know, along and staying with it. And uh, I started working at a, a psych hospital for adolescents. That gave me more experience, uh, and on and on. And that job came open again after a few years. So I thought, I'm going to go get that job. So I went over there, and of course in the psych hospital you have all kinds of, of young people uh, from even childhood uh, that have run them up with law mm -hmm. uh, and uh, dysfunctional families and the whole gamut, you know. Uh, so went over there and applied for the job, and I got it this time. And by that time, uh, there was a push to bring the little boys from Pine Bluff into the girls. And so we had little boys up to 10 years old mixed in with the girls and that kind of thing, and I ran the school program, which it, at that time, um, they were not even certified as a school. Uh, and I can compare this uh, really uh, to what's going on today mm -hmm. and what you're talking about in uh, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous uh, not being available uh, into how hungry the people no matter what the facility is mm -hmm. being in you know prison a training school a school anything they're hungry for real information uh, and so uh, we got into certified program, uh, the school program, and then there were uh, the males and females on that campus who were in for felonies. Um, and this included some of, y'all remember Jonesboro uh, shooting. Um, some of the young boys uh, uh, were in what they called um, uh, the pod. And they were denied school totally mm. uh, because they said they were too dangerous to go to school. What year was this, Jean? Oh, gosh. Um, 97, something like that. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, so I said, no, children, that's their job is to go to school. And if we're going to have children age here, we have to go to school. So we took the guys, the 20-something guys that were in the pod, and there was an old vocational building uh, that wasn't being used. And we gave them all sledgehammers. And we said, tear down the walls and make your school. They, they worked like fiends. <laughs> and I found a teacher who was willing to teach these kids. And so anyway, that started the school. Uh, for those kids um, and then one thing led to another and I left there and went to another psych hospital and realized that I needed training in substance abuse because so many of my kids over the years um, either they came from families with with those problems or they themselves had those problems so There was, back then, um, the inmates could get Pell Grants. And at UALR, there was a, a program to where you could um, uh, go get substance abuse training alongside the inmates because the inmates were getting Pell Grants and it was at UALR. And then Free World people uh, were also given stipends. And I thought, that's where I'm going to go get my training for substance abuse. So I went there and lo and behold, uh, I met a man named Anthony Thrash, and uh, we hit it off, uh, and this is my new color <laughs> that comes into my life, uh, and uh, we hit it off, started corresponding, etc., and I'm now, now married to Anthony, uh, but um, he's in um, the Tucker unit, uh, Life Without Parole. Anna and Jim have known him longer than I have uh, because it's been close to 30 years, I guess. Um, but um, uh, 
where do I go from here? I know so much about what's not available. Mm -hmm. um, and it's such a huge problem. And there's, there's as many issues as there are people in this world. Um, so I don't know where you start. Um, when I was working with kids, one thing that I firmly, still believe to this day, is you cannot just treat the child. Uh, you have to treat the family as a unit. Uh, and in fact, I, I made a proposal to one of my hospitals saying, we got a whole floor that's empty up there uh, rather than just bring this 12-year-old in for individual therapy and family therapy, yada, 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 all the traditional modalities, let's just open up that wing and tell the family, we will support you for 30 days and as a unit, live here. Live here. And we'll do intensive stuff. Uh, but it didn't fly because, you know, you got all the, that's out of the box, that doesn't work. So you can find funding for it, etc. But um, we have to figure out a way um, to let the public know um, that there are not monsters in these prisons. They're human beings. Um, and there's lawyers, and there's doctors, and there's, you know, Indian chiefs. And bankers and all the whole the whole button down thing. Uh, there's everybody, uh, and we also have to see how we can open the doors to the institutions because there's so many restrictions about even coming into an institution mm -hmm. till. Some people with past records are not allowed, mm -hmm. even though they've not committed any other crime. Uh, family members uh, that have somebody on visitation are not necessarily allowed to do this work or that work. Mm -hmm. uh, and what it does, and I learned this way back at the Children's Colony in Conway when it was called that, mm -hmm. is that when you have an institution, you have a closed society. And in that close society, one, one of the smartest teachers told me, since you're going to be working in a close society, there's got to be outside observation. Because once you lock those doors, be it the children's colony or the prison, and nobody can see what really goes on, you can do anything to those children, those adults, whatever. So we've got to push for independent oversight in all of these programs, um, and SATP died uh, the way it originally was when uh, the inmates couldn't get the certifications anymore because back then, the inmates would get certified uh, as a substance abuse treatment counselor, then go in back to their unit and be one of the counselors. Because I know Tony got certified and would move from unit to unit to establish that. So. Um, big problem. Big what issue. happened to their certification? Did they just withdraw it from them, or what? Uh, well, uh, they no longer um, have the ability to keep it up uh, because um, they don't get the training. They're not allowed out like they used to. Okay. Uh, it's ABC policy. It, it, it's all these restrictions, and if you look close, um, there's so many restrictions. Let me just say one more thing. There's a number of volunteer groups that come into the prisons. They're all segmented, uh, very little interaction between them. Um, but one of the problems is, is when, when men and women uh, apply for parole, clemency, etc., those people are restricted from saying the good things about the people they've been dealing with for years. They're restricted. They, they're not supposed to write a letter and say, I've known so-and-so for 25 years. He's been in my so-and-so class. Uh, and he's this and he's that. And that in itself is wrong. Because so many people in prison have nobody except for those mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. that come once a week. And who's going to say something for them? They don't have family to write letters. 
And then the, the, the boards will say, well, tell me about how good you've been or what you've done. Well, oh, I don't believe you, you know, you're a convict. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So we gotta look at, the, at, at what's feeding some of these restrictions uh, that's being placed on all of us, inside and out. Mm -hmm. And that's all I got to say. I can go on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.